almost feels like a family in here, doesn't it? That's the idea. Yeah. God never called us to be orphans, spiritual orphans. He called me to you and you to me, and us to him and him to us. The victory that she's describing was finished on the cross, <laughs> you might say. Uh, victory in Jesus, we sing that song. Uh, I brought the pillow from the uh, couch in my office. I work out of, of our home here, 10 minutes south of here. And some of you can't see where it is, but I, we found this in traveling at Tetelestai. Tetelestai is the word from uh, John 19.30. Tetelestai. In Aramaic, it's Meshalem. Meshalem. And uh, it's a past perfect tense of a Greek, one Greek word that means it has been finished. Or finished. <laughs> it has been finished. Aramaic, Jan Majira's translation says, Behold, it is finished. Uh, we need to remember that your redemption and mine are finished. Our victory is finished. It's been paid for. So we don't need to pay on it again. And when something is finished, start there. Start from a point of victory. And then it, the effort is to claim the victory, to see the victory come into manifestation. It's not to get the victory. You have the victory as you prayed and manifested today. So tetelestai. Uh, Meshalem, it is finished. Meshalem, can we say that? Meshalem. Meshalem. That's the actual word he said on the cross. Aramaic, he spoke. Whether and I don't care if it was like this or like, like this. I give zero thought to that. When he was on the tree, he said, "It is finished. It has been finished." Meshalem, quoting the Old Testament too. He may have quoted the whole chapter there in the Old Testament, but different Sunday. Well, next Sunday is, as she said, we call it Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. Um, and Tom's going to share some wonderful things. And uh, our emphasis there is, is about our victory in His resurrection, that He is alive. Uh, but today is a good time, I felt like, to talk a little bit about His sacrifice there's a huge percentage of the four Gospels about His suffering and His death. If you avoid reading Scriptures about death, you're going to have to avoid a lot of the Bible. Uh, but you just need to put it in the right category, right? Let it be what it is. Because we have the victory over death, as Jesus did. We're going to talk about being redeemed, about redemption. That's a, sort of a long churchy word a little bit. But um, some of these words we hear about in songs, we hear about in prayers, but we don't sit down to think about the scriptural roots of the meaning of some of these words that really have a lot to do with defining, Joanna, who we are. These words define who we are. Uh, Zion, there's a lamb in your life. There's a lamb in your life. Blood. Why does the Bible talk about blood all the time? Blood. What's this about the cross? I don't want to think about the cross. It, 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 uh, some people see it as a, the weapon that killed him. I don't want to, I don't want to think about that. Well, why is it all over the Bible? Why is blood all over the Bible? These things have meaning that define who we are. It defines our Christianity. It defines our redemption. So what is it to be redeemed? We sing it. What is it to be redeemed? We're going to talk about the Lamb, the blood, and the cross. Just an overview. Nothing deep on, well, I'd like it not to be deep, but I'm excited. <laughs> I'm more excited than I have time to talk about. Last weekend was, some of you were here, was a big room full of explosiveness with Robert's Learden here and it was so exciting and uh, he really, it really showed a lot about who CFF is as a body to bring in other voices, to minister to us, to minister 
the power of redemption to us, the power of the Holy Spirit to us in a fresh way. So now we are looking forward to Resurrection Sunday, next Sunday, and this is a good time this week to uh, consider partaking with, uh, of communion. And live streamers, hi, love you very much. Love to hear from you anytime, every time, what stirs you, what blesses you, what needs you have, what we need to pray for, encouragement, what Lord's showing you in the Scriptures. And um, you may want to do communion at home this week. Why not? Why not do it at home? If the Word doesn't live at home, uh, uh, you know, if it lives here but doesn't live at home, uh, a whole big chunk of your life is, is going to be uh, sort of not gospel-focused. You don't need a lectern at a stage in your living room, that's for sure. You just need the power of the Holy Spirit and manifestation at home. So uh, you may do communion at home. I know our Tuesday night Zoom group is going to do communion on Tuesday night, very simply, over Zoom. Uh, some people do it every day. Some people, some churches, certain denominations do it every Sunday, all year round. So there's not a rule to this, right? Everybody, they want a rule in the Bible for these things, and there aren't any. <laughs> That's why, because God gives you the choice of inspiration, right? Um, so I, I really want the discussion today to build a love for communion, a love for the Lord's Supper. And remember that was as they were eating a meal in, in Mark, it specifically says that, that they, the Lord uh, uh, shared with them about the idea of his, his body and his blood. He even said if when he really wanted to shock the, uh, the followers, he said, well, if you don't eat my flesh, and if you don't drink my blood, I got nothing to do with you. That's pretty shocking. Sounds like cannibalism to, to somebody not paying attention. But he often did that. The people that were hungry understood. The fools never understand. No matter, you could explain it for a month and they wouldn't understand it. Right? They would reject anything you said about it. But Jesus is looking for everything from us, right? That's why he said, eat my flesh, <laughs> drink my blood. <laughs> it's visceral, it's deep, it's figurative, it's powerful. So that we get the level of commitment he's asking for. Jesus doesn't leave you much choice. There's no mediocrity in Jesus. There's no, you just can't ride the wave in the middle somewhere. There isn't one. Because he asks for everything, and if you don't give him everything, you really don't get much of anything. You don't get it. All he wants is everything. And we see that in communion. We see that in redemption. We see that in the, bla the, the uh, lamb and the blood and the cross. And all of those things define who we are. The Lamb, the blood, and the cross. All of those things help explain the Bible's message from start to finish. So I want to build a love for, for the wine and the bread, the juice and the bread. Just as we talk, we're not going to do communion today, but we are going to do it, as I said, in our Zoom group on Tuesday night. You may want to do it at home. And Tom, yes, we're planning to do it next Sunday, right? Yeah, as a part of, of that morning. I'm going to mention uh, this morning the divine exchange sometimes we call it being bought with a price and that our lives are not our own. We'll touch on those things along with this. The divine exchange, uh, this is one way to describe this, these verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses uh, 14 and 15. This is from NIV. It says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died, that's Jesus, that's what we're talking about today, his, his crucifixion, his sacrifice. One died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that, why? This shows the purpose of him dying in this verse. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. 
That's one of the great summary scriptures of Christian living, right there. See, uh, one died and therefore all died. In other words, Paul talked about that, that when Christ died, we died with Him. We were crucified with Him. This is called identification. It's we are in Christ. We are in everything He did and what He went through spiritually uh, as a representation we went through. When he, was, when he died, we died with Him. When He was buried, we were buried with Him. When He was raised, we were raised with Him in Christ, we call it, in the Lord, in Him. And that's why when He ascended, we ascended with Him, and we, we call that being seated in the heavenlies. These are all spiritual truths that, that define the Christian experience. So, this is the divine exchange here. A few verses later, after that, in 2 Corinthians, God made, this is 2 Corinthians 5.21, this is NIV, God made Him who had no sin to be sin. God made Him who had no sin at all to be sin. Got to let some of these things sink in. Some of these things we don't talk about a whole lot, but we need to. Why did he do that? Why did he make him to be sin? A sin offering. The final sin offering. Read the book of Hebrews sometime. Great assignment. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 especially, I think, in this context. Hebrews 9 and 10. But he, God did this. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that. So that tells us why. It tells us why. So that in him we might become the what? Righteous. The righteousness of God. That's why he did it. That's why Jesus took all of our sin, all of your weirdness, all of your mistakes, all of who you used to be, all of the mistakes, not just mistakes, Sometimes I don't like the word mistakes. Sin is bigger than mistakes. Oh, I, I dropped my glasses. No, sometimes it's I stole my neighbor's glasses and I knew I was doing it, so to speak. You know, there's, there's, there's missing the mark by mistake, but there's missing the mark that we shouldn't have done. We had the choice to not do it, but we did it anyway. God knows all those things and He still Put, he laid all of your sin, all of your missing the mark, all of our unrighteousness, past, present, and future, unrighteous decisions that you will make in the future have already been laid on the cross. And you haven't even sinned those yet. Wow. That we would be the righteousness of God, the righteousness of that's justification. That's what that is, the righteousness of God. Father, show us your word this morning. Show us what Christ did on the tree. Show us that it is finished. Show us our redemption, that we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Father, show us that there's a Lamb in our life. Show us the power of the blood, the power of the cross, and what they mean to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Father. The divine exchange we're talking about, in a sense, on the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had lived my life. This is one way to try to describe this exchange. And he now treats me as if I had lived Jesus' life. That might take some thought. But this was the divine exchange. He took upon himself on the tree, on the cross, all sin of all mankind. Mankind just needs to accept that. You with me? Yes. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had lived my stinking life. But because of what Christ did, God now treats me as if I had lived the life of Jesus, the perfect life of Jesus. You're right, it doesn't make sense. 
you're right, it's too good to be true. But that's why it's true. In a sense, when God looks at the cross, he sees you. And in a sense, when he looks at you, he sees Christ. It's another way to say that. There's this exchange. I traded my sin for his righteousness. This is not just intellectual, but you should feel this. Your redemption should get to your gut. You might not be a crier or a laugher, that's fine. But God designed your emotions as much as he designed your intellect. God designed it. So we use, we use our mind and our, intellect, and our emotions to worship him, to praise him, to live for him. Right? This is beautiful here in, in 1 Peter. It just says Peter, but it's 1 Peter. In NIV, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were, what's that word? Redeemed. Redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. You had a stinking empty life. I don't care if you were the, the king of your street. I don't care if you were the vice president of the chess club in your cul-de-sac. You, you had an empty life. <laughs> Me too. Ah, that's what we were redeemed from, but with the precious what? Blood. That's one of our words. The blood of Christ, a what? A lamb without blemish or defect. Those are the words we're looking for as we read a few of these scriptures, Samantha. We're looking for redemption, the lamb, the blood, and the cross. Yes, Lord. Oh, my gosh. We were redeemed with the blood. We were redeemed with the blood of a lamb. We were redeemed with the blood of a lamb. There's a lamb in your life. We were redeemed with the blood of a lamb. So, we want to know more. Lord, show me what that means in the Word. We were redeemed with the blood of a lamb. There's some Jewishness in your Christianity if you didn't notice that. Did you ever notice that? Read Hebrews. You feel pretty Jewish at the end. We act like on Pentecost they all changed and they started this new religion that afternoon called Christianity. They put out a new shingle. They weren't Jewish anymore. They never went to the synagogue. They changed their food. You know, they started watching the NFL, <laughs> speaking English. They were as Jewish as they ever were before. They were they had the same skin and tradition and habits. Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> he came to fulfill the law. Right? Yes. <laughs> they didn't say, we've got to start a new religion. What should we call it? What should we? It should end in ITY, because they all seem to end in ITY. Christ, Christ, Christianity, yeah, let's do it. They were following a, the Jewish Messiah. They believed he fulfilled all the law that they are family and heritage and love forever. And he fulfilled it. And they saw him alive after he was crucified. Next week we'll hear that. But we were redeemed by the blood of a lamb. That's several of our words here today. To be redeemed, there's two Greek terms in the New Testament primarily that refer to our redemption. One emphasizes especially being bought back. Being bought back. The, uh, in, in Greece, the agora is where you went shopping. Instead of the shopping mall, you went to the agora. And one of the words for redeemed has that word agora in it. Ex agorazo, I think it is. And that's to be bought back. To be bought back. Uh, to buy out the marketplace. You, you, we've been bought back from the enemy's kingdom. Yes. Seth, we've been bought back from the enemy's kingdom <laughs> by the precious blood of a lamb. We've been bought. That's our redemption. That's what redemption means. We've been bought back 
from the enemy's kingdom. You're bought. Sometimes I sign my emails, bought, comma, Kevin. We've been bought out of the enemy's kingdom. And all, redemption also, redeemed also means ransomed. A price is paid, something's been exchanged, and you're redeemed. You've been ransomed. And it, it, by extension, it means to be delivered or to be set free. Two places in the Gospels, at least two, it says, the Son of Man came to give his life a what? A ransom for many, a redemption price for many. When I was a kid it, in the early 60s, every kitchen had a drawer with all the extra stuff you didn't know where to put. And jammed in that drawer, the one thing you had to have, Ruth, you might remember this, is green stamps. <laughs> S and H, green stamps, jammed in that drawer with the pens that don't work and the busted glasses. And as soon as somebody got hacked off enough that that drawer was exploding, they would, you know, somebody with some sense, usually mom or grandma, would get all those stamps out. Because when you bought stuff at the grocery, Lena, you remember this? Okay, I'm not crazy. Okay, well, maybe I am. But uh, so you, you, you what's it? Uh oh. Don't tell these stories. So you get the green stamps there, and, and, and you stick them or you lick them or you something, and you put them in these little books. And then you go to the store, and it's what's, what's it called? Redemption. The Redemption Center. Everybody uses this example when they teach them redemption. I thought I'd throw it in there. Uh, the Redemption Center. And it was uh, the most boring store you've ever entered in your life. It had just little dumb sort of painted shelves in there. And a toaster was always a part of things. It was always a toaster. And if you had, you know, 10,000 of these booklets, you could trade them in. You could have them redeemed for a new toaster. Electric knife. Electric knife, yes, yeah, see? That's the upper crust part of, of the country, up there, the electric knife, see? Uh, yeah, these, these things you can't live without. That was redemption. I give you 10,000 booklets that took 12 years to put together and $40,000 worth of groceries, and you give me a toaster. Redemption. The tickets are now yours, and the toaster is now mine. Give me that, and I'm gone from the redemption center. There you go. That's some deep spiritual truth there. But that's what redeemed means, to be bought back, to be ransomed. You know, your value, I love this statement. We talked about this one. I talked about this at a little church in Troy, a little white church, before this building was built. We were having fellowships there. It was cold as hell in that room. <laughs> Excuse me. The little church we used to rent in Troy. I, I lived in Michigan at the time. We all had our coats on sitting in there, but that was CFF. Tom and Sue were there. Some of you were there. I think the bathroom was downstairs in that yes. place. Yeah. Whew. <laughs> but I talked. <laughs> it was like little rascals or something. Uh, but I taught about this, that your value is determined by your cost. Your value is determined by your cost. You are so valuable because you cost God everything. His only son. Look at how valuable you are, Ken, to God. Your value determined by the cost. What, it costs God everything to have you. So 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, you are not your own. You were what? You were bought with a price. The price being the precious blood of a lamb on a tree. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your what? Body. We were bought with a price. You are not your own, it says. Sorry, you know, a lot of people sort of want to look into Christianity so that their life could be wonderful, so they, they can continue to be the Lord of their life, but that they can have all the stuff. 
God, you created everything. I just want all the stuff, and I want to run my life like I always did with all the stuff. I want more stuff than anybody else, but I want to run my life with all this new stuff. Uh, that's imagination. That's fantasy. That's not Christianity, right? Let's not think like the world. Let's not be conformed to the world. He's the Lord, and He's the Lord that can give you all the stuff that you need to carry out the Lord's work with great enthusiasm. You are not your own. Let that sink in. You are not your own because you've been bought with a price. Now you can walk away from that, be your own Lord. You and your three and a half pound brain can go figure out the universe. There's trillions of galaxies, trillions, T, trillions of galaxies like the Milky Way that we're in. Trillions that we can even see, that, that are even known in our part of the... And there's hundreds of billions of stars in each of those trillions of galaxies just in this area that we can see. And your three and a half pound brain is going to figure life out. Oh, that's hilarious. I don't have that much faith to be an atheist. you got to be mighty sure to be an atheist. I don't know, I don't, uh, I know that's poetic, but I, I can't, I don't know, who can, who can be that sure? Who can be that mad at a God who doesn't exist? <laughs> so this verse that says, your life is not your own, you're bought with a price, There's, here's another version of it from uh, N.T. Wright's translation that I love, New Testament for Everyone, it's called. Uh, he translates it, or don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, the spirit, of, uh, the spirit God gave you so that you don't belong to yourselves? You were quite an expensive what? Purchase. purchase. You were bought with a price. You were quite an expensive purchase. Huh. So glorify God in your body. You don't belong to yourselves. I don't belong to myself. That almost sounds like I'm not the Lord. <laughs> Doesn't it? That's what we mean when we say dying to self. That's what Paul meant when he wrote the Galatians and he said, well, if he said, not I, but Christ, not I, comma, but Christ, four words in that verse to meditate on, not I, but Christ, the anointed one, not, uh, it ain't about me anymore. Christianity starts with leaving yourself behind. That's when you find yourself. That's the paradox. There's a lot of paradoxes in Christianity. You give and you're more blessed. <laughs> it makes no sense. You, know? you serve and you're the king. You, know? you don't belong to yourself. You are quite an expensive purchase. That's a great translation of the Greek of that verse. Bought with a price. Galatians 4, and from the NET, it's one of my favorite translations lately, the NET. It's got some deep Bible notes in there. But when the appropriate time had come, God sent out His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to do what? Redeem those who were under the law. Why? 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 Why did He redeem us? So that, so that we may be adopted as sons with full, full, full rights. That word adoption is a good word if you understand what it means. It's a good word. And then in Galatians 3.14, He redeemed us, there's our word, redeemed us in order that, there's some purpose, in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. Tom, you and I were talking about this the other day. So that, so that shows why, why, show, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. That's right. Maybe we'll hear more about that next week. So look for the so that's, look for the why, look for the purpose of redemption. See, Now let's just touch on the lamb, the blood, and the cross. Why, why what's a lamb got to do with anything? Well, lamb is used 
100 times in King James in the Bible. 31 of those are in the New Testament. Uh, the Passover, the Passover, Exodus 12. We don't, we don't have uh, time to read that, but that'd be something you could check this week, Exodus 12. Casey, we doing all right? Okay. Uh, Exodus 12 talks about the Passover meal that they had. At the end of the plagues, the children of Israel were in Egypt trying to get out of there. Moses was speaking to get them out of there, and uh, Pharaoh didn't want to let him go, right? But so here's the last shot at this, is that all the firstborn were going to die unless you put the blood on the uh, lintel of the house in Egypt. Because the evil of Pharaoh opened the door to the what he called the destroyer, the evil circumstances that were destined to happen because the door was open. You can explain that theologically lots of different ways, but it calls it the destroyer. So that night in every home either the firstborn died or a lamb died was killed because they had to sacrifice you know a lamb of the first year and the the story of the Passover meal defined the Jewish people since then till now still does and there's aspects of the Passover meal that apply to our salvation, that apply to the communion meal, the, the bread and, and the wine. And in our case, it's the lamb that's serving it. You know how Jesus is all in all. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus, like in Hebrews, Jesus is the priest. He's the sacrificial offering. And he's the location, he's the temple where the priest and the offering are. He's all three of those things. It's almost like he's our way and our truth and our life. All of the things. Jesus is everything. See, that's why a relationship with him defines who you are. It defines your existence. That's why every, we have a hundred thousand heartbeats a day. We dedicate each one to the Lord Jesus Christ and thank him for redemption. We have about I don't know, 25,000 breaths in a day. We dedicate each one to His glory. God that made us and redeemed us, saved us, rescued us. We were saved, we we're being saved, and we will be saved. It's all the tenses of the verb of salvation. It's beautiful. So the Passover and the communion are vital. First to the Jews, the Passover, and now the sacrifice of Christ. And that's the word sacrifice really ties this whole morning together, that, that he sacrificed himself. God sacrificed, uh, you know, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and without blood being shed, there was no re redemption of sin in the Old Testament. Uh, so when you see fancy words like atonement, propitiation, payment, uh, that's what is being talked about. A Abraham and Isaac were talking about a lamb. Remember Abraham? Uh, the, the firstborn male belonged to God. In, in Old Testament Scripture, the firstborn male belonged to God. And God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, the firstborn that belonged to God. So it's a little bit like the crucifixion of Jesus. Took him up on a hill. Isaac carried wood. And Isaac looks at his dad, says, Dad, there's an altar here, there's a fire here, there's wood here, there's a knife here. And the great line, where is the lamb? The great line, where is the lamb? And that's a question that you have to answer, I have to answer Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb in my life? Where's the lamb? God provided a, a, a ram in the thicket. And Hebrew said that's what God had in mind all along. But Abraham was, was willing to give his firstborn son back to God 
who, it, who he belonged to in the first place, the firstborn son. But God provided a lamb. That's redemption. He provided a lamb. And remember in Peter, we were redeemed by the precious blood of a lamb. And that happened on a tree, on a cross. Remember in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God, it says twice in that chapter. When they saw Jesus, they were figuring out, wait a minute. By what he's saying and doing, we're just getting started here. But this appears to be the Lamb of God. Right? And then Paul later said, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And that word Passover, Pashka, Pashka, meant the Passover lamb. Paul said, Christ, the anointed one, is our Passover lamb. Jesus is your Passover lamb. There's a lamb in your life, Dwayne. He's our Passover lamb. Book of Revelation has 27 of these occurrences of lamb in it. That surprised me. I figured, well, in the Gospels, he's a lamb. And in Revelation, he's a lion. Makes a better story if you're writing for Marvel Comics. <laughs> there is one time in Revelation, he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. One time. 27 times in the book of Revelation. In eschatology. In the book of Revelation, he's called a lamb. Still. That's shocking to me. That tells me that his death and sacrifice I should never forget. Even though I'm resurrection crazy, I'm Pentecost crazy, I'm Holy Spirit crazy, he never wants us to forget our redemption was paid for by a lamb on a tree with his blood. Remember, after, after he was raised for 40 days he was in a resurrected body. And he showed doubting Thomas his hands and, and his side. He kept the wounds in his resurrected body. I would not have allowed that. I would have said, look, you're resurrected. The past is past. It's negative. Don't think, don't be so negative. <laughs> Talking about the wounds and the cross. Don't be so negative. Always looking in your past. Sometimes the past is exactly what you need to look at. You just need to ask God, what is it about my past that I need to see? And what is it about the past I should never think of again? Right? Old is not bad unless it's evil bad. <laughs> Ephesians is an old book. Right. So, Revelation has a lot to do with the Lamb. In fact, a lot of Revelation talks about a throne, Lenny, a throne, and on the throne it says God is there and the Lamb. It calls Jesus the Lamb in Revelation. On the throne, God and the Lamb. What an amazing way to describe the heavenly authority in the future. God and the Lamb. Okay? It talks about the presence of the Lamb in Revelation, the song of the Lamb, the war of the Lamb, the marriage of the Lamb, the Lamb's book of life, the throne of the Lamb, the, the, the Lamb being the temple, the light, the uh, Lamb's light, all of that described as, as a lamb. I want to mention now the blood and the cross. Do we need to do anything with tech here, Casey? Or you good? Okay. Tell me if we need to stop or stand on my head or something. Blood and cross. We're wrapping this thing up. Blood and cross. The reason it talks so much about the blood and talks still so much about the cross. Paul wrote about the cross Long after Pentecost, the blood and the cross were still important. It, language. All of our thinking is in language. language. You should be interested in language. The Bible is given in language. 
It's been translated from one language to another. Language, we should love language, even if that wasn't your favorite in school. It was God's idea to put His will in writing. It was His idea, complain to management. Kevin, why are you so interested in the details of the text? Because God said, I'm going to send my will in a book. Hey, that's great. See, it's, it's actually a collection of books, a library. Your Bible's a library. <laughs> but the blood and the cross are figurative to represent his, first of all, his death. Think about that. Many times in the Bible, blood is put for his death. When it's talking about blood, it's talking about the death of Christ. The blood of Christ is to remind us of the sacrificial death of Christ. The last. Of his death. The cross, his death. But this figure of speech is is transferred. It's the blood and the cross refer to his death, and in this case, his death refers to what it accomplished. What do we need to do here? Okay. Testing. Come in, Tokyo. Okay. Um, today we're going to be talking about redemption. Oh, three people just keeled over. I want you to get this, okay? I want you to get this. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to wrap this up. Miracles do happen. Um, the blood and the cross. Why does it talk so much about blood and the cross, especially in the New Testament? Because, like, let's take the blood, for example. The blood is often talking about the death of Christ. And not just that, but what His death accomplished. So with all those occurrences of, of blood, look at, okay, it's talking about the, what the blood has done for me it's what his death has done for me, not just the fact that he died. A lot of people, we all die. But the accomplishment of the lamb dying, the perfect lamb, the final sacrifice, Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. That's what it means when you read a lot of verses about blood. It's talking about the accomplishments of his death. So it says blood, it's, it's emphasizing death, and death emphasizing the accomplishments of that death just by saying the word blood. You with me? That's a fancy word called metalepsis. It's a, a figure of speech for you English buffs, okay? And that's true with the cross. Many times it talks about the cross. And when it talks about the cross, it's talking about the, the death of Christ on the cross, and not just the fact that He died. Many people were crucified. But it's talking about the accomplishments of the death on the cross. But then the, the verse just says the word cross. So that should enrich your meaning when you read a verse about the blood of Christ or the cross of Christ. And it wasn't just the, the amount, listen, it wasn't just the amount of pain that Jesus went through. Sometimes we sort of turn it into a measurement of pain, like he saved me because he felt a greater magnitude of pain than anyone has ever felt, therefore that was good enough to save me. That's not it. People have jumped off of 200-story buildings. They've been run over by steamrollers, flat dead. They, people have been skinned alive with knives while they were alive and their skin peeled off. People have been tortured, great pain. We're not talking about the, the measurement of the amount of pain for Jesus. He had tremendous pain like nobody else, but that's not what we're talking about. If you haven't seen the Passion movie, by the way, I, I've only seen it one time in my life. But if you haven't ever seen it, I recommend you force yourself to see it, one time at least. Because you start to taste what he went through physically. And it's amazing what percentage of the Gospels uncovers the, the visceral 
evil and ugliness of his suffering and his death. I know people that don't even read those chapters because they, they think it's negative. It should get to you. It should bother you. It should upset you. That's the nature of his death. Him hanging on the tree was the, was the most beautiful thing and the most ugly thing at the same time. Because it was love that held him on the tree. The most beautiful and the most terrible and ugly and hideous at the same time. Blood and cross. And we're going to try to go to the next one if we can. Casey, can we jump? There you go. Blood, 93 times in the New Testament. Blood. Um, gospels say that, uh, but uh, no, Judas said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Talking about Jesus. We mentioned that other thing. Uh, these are, are words that deal with the blood in the, in the New Testament. The redemption through his blood, justification through his blood, brought near to God through his blood, cleanses and it frees. And uh, in Acts it says that God purchased the church through the blood of his son. The new covenant in my blood, the faith in his blood, reconciliation from the blood, forgiveness from the blood, peace from the blood, all of that from blood. It uses the word blood because it says all of that from the death of Christ and because it means all of that from the accomplishments of the death of Christ by just saying blood. Are you with me on that? I want you to get that. All of those things are listed and described about blood. And all of that is, is in his blood. Cross is the same way. 28 times in the New Testament. They're not all just in the Gospels either. The peace by the blood of his cross. Uh, Colossians talks about that we have peace. Interesting tying those words together, blood and cross. We have peace by the blood of the cross. <laughs> Not just bloody cross, but the death and the accomplishments of the blood and the cross. Accomplishments of his death. Oh boy, okay. Yeah, our sins and our debt were nailed to the cross. Colossians 2.14. All your junk was nailed to the tree when he was nailed there. So when you feel like junk next week, just say, well, that got nailed to the tree. And if it takes you writing it on a piece of paper and taking it to a tree in your yard and nailing it to the tree, feel free, whatever it takes. Remember the power of the cross. In 1 Corinthians 1, uh, the foolishness of the cross. You, you know, you wear a cross. I told a waiter two days ago that I liked this, the cross that he was wearing. If you wear a cross, this world thinks cro the cross is foolishness. Oh, you believe in that, right? But Paul called it foolishness to the world, but the power of the cross. So now when I say the power of the cross, what do you think about? Paul called it the power of the cross after Pentecost when they had the Spirit already. It was the power of the death and what was accomplished by the death and just use the word cross. The power of the cross is the power by what he did for us on the tree. You with me? That's so exciting. Paul said he, he only boasts in the cross. And because of that, the world is crucified to me, Paul said, and I'm crucified to the world. That he would use that word crucified. Meaning, I'm dead to this world. This world thinks I'm useless and worthless and devoting my life to something unreal. That's what they think. But they're dead to me too, Paul said. Reconciled in one body by the cross, Ephesians 2. I told you about holes in the hands. Remember, by his stripes we were healed. By his stripes we were healed. Stripes, in fact, there's another one. Not just, the, a lot of people were, were whipped and striped to death probably. 
but the stripes represent the, the punishment, the torture, and the torture represents what he paid for by the torture. By his stripes, we were healed. Any problem in your life, in your body, in your mind, in your spiritual life, any problem, there's a stripe for that on his back. Whatever you can come up with, there's a stripe for that. He's dealt with that. Tetelestai, Meshalem, it is finished. It has been finished. So, that's why Paul said, in my body, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was beaten too. And the, the, the word, Greek word stigma, stigmata. Paul had marks on his body, but he dedicated all the junk he went through to the one who had bought him. He was bought with a price. You're bought with a price. You've got lashes on you. You've got scars in your life, in your body and soul and spirit. You've got scars in life and living. Let's dedicate each of those scars to the one who redeemed us, who bought us back. Let's dedicate it to the lamb, the blood of the lamb who died on the tree. Because of his stripes, we were healed. So let's, when you see the communion this week or any time in the future, let's think of what each thing represents. Let's think of the lamb serving us uh, what meant so much to the Jews in being delivered and being rescued. That was a divine exchange. We are bought with a price. Our lives are not our own. We no longer belong to ourselves. We've been bought with a price. That's redemption. That's the lamb. That's the blood. That's the cross. And we look forward to his resurrection. Thank you. So, wow. I think um, Kevin was talking about every, the breath that we take and um, think about how the last three Psalms speak about the breath um, and everything that's praise and let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And it's interesting because there's a lot of things that people go through in life where they don't, you know, they might be lacking in their physical realm, or they might be in prison in Russia, or, you know, people who are risking their life for the sake of the gospel, right? Yeah. Or even in the church epistles, Paul being the stigmata of Paul, bearing in his body the marks of the Lord. You know, and, and I just think how every breath that we take, we, can al- we will always have a breath, no matter where we're going through, Unless we fall asleep, there's always breath. So how, how, what a great way to live that we can with every breath we take this week. Rejoice in um, the redemption of our Lord, the, you know, the blood, the cross, all these things, that the lamb that's there, that's a part of our lives. Isn't that great? Good stuff. So we look forward to next week, and um, I'll pray, and we'll head on out to a new week. How's that? Father, how thankful we are for um, your son and that price that was paid, how costly and how valuable your children are to you um, because of how expensive his sacrifice was. And we just lay things down at his feet right now. We come before his throne and your throne of grace And there's times of need, and we thank you that we realize that we are always in need every day for your voice to speak to us. And I thank you that we walk out in victory as we claim the things, the truth of your scripture. This week, lead us to people who need to know about the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ, of what he um, represents, of the accomplishments within life that he paid for. 
and I thank you that we can have just an effervescence as we go out this week and that um, the people, wherever they are across this world, we pray for those who indeed are risking their life for the sake of the gospel, to give them protection, wisdom, inspiration, and just that you lead us to people who need to hear of your truth and of the joy of life in Jesus. And it's in his wonderful name we pray, and we give you thanks and glory in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Have a blessed week. Okay. Thank you.